everybody. Welcome back to Terry's Tribe, where we talk all things books, because we, we know we love books. I am your author, Terry Wells Brown. I write under the pen name T. Wells Brown, and I have a series out, Women of Wine Country, which is romantic thrillers. Uh, I just have a brand new book out just a few days ago that is free until the end of September. So if you're interested in checking that book out, go to my author page, T. Wells Brown on Facebook, or you can go join my reader group, uh, Terry's Tribe, and it's free everywhere that I am. You can find it. So today I want to introduce to you Stacy Jabba. She is an amazing author who's super prolific, and she writes in a little bit different genre than I do. She writes in, am I going to get this right or mess it up? You've got some um, women's lit, lit out. Is that what it is? Yeah, I have some chick lit, um, mysteries, young adult, and even a couple children's books. So yeah, I saw that I was on your website this morning. And I was like, man, she's really prolific. She's got a lot of, <laughs> a lot of stuff out. So we're so happy to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> so how long have you been writing? Really my whole life. I mean, I remember writing my first story when I was about 10 years old in third grade. And then by the time I was in fifth grade, um, we were doing a lot of writing in school then. Um, we had a teacher that was just, um, he assigned us a lot of fiction and short stories and creative kind of essays. So I just really flourished um, in so his that's class. when you got the writing bug in third that's grade. That's yeah, fantastic. so definitely when I got the writing bug and I was writing a series of mystery stories by the time I was 12. So I just always loved to read. So I think writing was the natural progression for me. I think that that's true for a lot of us, um, you know, bookworms, they used to call us back in the day. I think I'm <laughs> But back in the day, we were called bookworms. And um, I think a lot of us who read, especially mysteries, I grew up on the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew. Mm -hmm. um, we wrote because that was, you know, that was a natural, like you said, transition. Yeah, I absolutely loved uh, Nancy Drew. I think the first, the first mystery series I read was the Bobsy Twins. I remember reading that in second grade. I, and I just I just literally remember the first time I read a mystery and it was one of those Bobby trends and I just loved it. I think it was a doomed buggy mystery or something like that. And I was hooked and I loved that you could go back and read the other books in the series. And then I progressed to Nancy Drew and Trixie Belden, Hardy Boys. Um, so those were definitely all the, my all the classics really. Yeah. yeah. So you write in, so how many different genres are you in right now? Um, so mysteries, young adult sports, and um, romantic comedy, chiclet. Those are my three main genres. I, I'm focusing more on the chiclet right now. Um, I, all the when I started, I did this right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it makes sense to focus on that. All the moms are stuck at home. Yes. <laughs> and that's what I'd like to read. It's kind of my writing has kind of evolved as my reading tastes have evolved over the years. When I started, I, I did a lot of mysteries because that's what I like to read. And then most recently, I think the past 10 years or so, I've gotten into reading more humorous romance. So then I was drawn to write in that genre. So it just, I think it's just, I, I write what I feel like reading <laughs> at that that's time. Smart. They say the most successful authors are the ones who write in the genre they love to read. Right. So, so you started writing when you were in third grade. When did you first publish? When was your first published book? My first published book um, was actually when I was 18 years old. And I wrote it in study hall when I was 16. I did a lot of writing um, in longhand in study hall um, in classes when I was bored. <laughs> Sit in the back of the class writing. And then I'd go home and type it up on my electric typewriter. And that was my hockey novel Face Off. And I wrote it because, again, I, was, I wanted to write something that I wanted to read. And I was very interested in ice hockey at that time. And I couldn't find any young adult fiction about ice hockey. So I decided to write it partially for my own entertainment and partially because I had heard that there was a big competition for teenage writers. I had seen it in a magazine. I think it was Tiger Beat magazine, the young adult um, the Avon Flair Young Adult Novel Competition, and they had they held it every other year, and it was for kids ages 13 to 18, I think, and the winner got a publishing contract with Avon Books, so when I was writing it, that was sort of the 
the goal in the back of my mind was to enter it in this competition if I finish the book. Um, and I did that. And then I found out my freshman year in college um, that the book had won the competition. So then I got a publishing contract and got the opportunity to work with one of the editors. And, um, yeah, and then well, the book that, was published. That's mm -hmm. fantastic to be 18 right out of high school and just into college and get a publishing contract. That's amazing. Yeah, that was exciting. Um, unfortunately, there was a lot of rejection after that. Yeah. Even though the book did it did well, and I, I, would, I got fan mail, it was on different reading lists. I had the benefit of working with an editor on that book. Um, we went back and forth several times, and she just kind of helped me to make that book as strong as possible. And then after that, um, I, I had I was kind of like on my own again, writing new books, and I learned a lot. But I, I still, I mean, I was only eighteen, so I had to really hone my skills and find my voice and. Um, just get more polished. So there, there were several years of rejection between the publication of my first and my second book, but it was definitely a great learning experience. And ironically, um, uh, e even though the book went out of print, eventually I brought it back, I brought Facebook back into print around 2012 and it still sells copies every day. And I published a sequel um, 25 years later. So um, it takes place a year later <laughs> in book time, but in reality it was- um, So did you bring the first book up to current time or did you leave it in the time that it was written? Yeah, that's a good question because I was, I was torn about what to do. Um, so for the first book, I decided to bring it up into current time. It just would have had to change too much of the story. And um, so I just, for that one, I just took out the references to like hockey players that were retired now and um, music groups, that kind of thing, slang that was dated. I just kind of made it more set in a generic kind of time so kids today could relate to it. But for the sequel, and I wrote a, I wrote like a, um, an about the author, just kind of explaining why I chose to do that and, you know, acknowledging that some things might be, you know, like school situation, you know, um, might be handled differently nowadays than it was handled back then, but this is why I just, you know, the book, it's a lot of kids are related to the book and I, I just didn't want to rewrite the book. I just wanted to kind of bring it back and um, update it for new readers. So I basically just wanted to take out the things that might've been distracting to them, the really blatant things like hockey players and, you know, yeah. that were been retired. But for the sequel, I did bring it into modern times and that was really fun. So I got to have them texting and on social media. That's good. Um, yeah. and, and that was really fun to do that, to kind of revisit really. these characters. Yeah, yeah, that's smart. So um, hockey's, hockey's interesting. So your hockey, do you have the, just the two books out in the hockey series? Yep, just the two books. I'm thinking about doing a third one. I'm kind of toying with the idea for a third one, but for now it's just those two. How many books total do you have across all the genres? Um, I think about 10. I have two mysteries, so two hockey books, a young adult, paranormal, um, two chiclet books. Um, the, and then uh, I have a paperback children's picture book and then like a couple of box sets of like a box set of children's books and then a box set of just all my mysteries. So. That's great. And so what's your favorite genre right now to write in? I think right now, um, I had a blast writing off size is equal to face off. I mean, that was definitely, I had a lot of fun writing that. But I think my favorite genre to write in, the one that comes naturally, the most naturally to me now is chiclet and romantic comedy, um, and, which is surprising to me because when I was, I have kind of more of a, I'm introverted. I have more of a serious <laughs> personality, I think. But so it was just really interesting to me when I just started writing um, Chiclet and just this sassy, humorous voice <laughs> came out of me. I was like, oh, where did that come from? But I like it. You know? <laughs> I think that's true for a lot of writers. We tend to be introverted and, and don't like to go out and people a lot. Um, and it's hard for us for our personalities to flow in groups of people. But on the paper, it's so easy to just like be all the things you can't be in person, right? Right. Yeah. Um, so what do you have coming up? Um, so right now I'm in between books. I'm thinking about doing a, a Christmas novella in my storybook Valley Chiclet series. It's set at a, the series is set at a fairy tale theme park in the Catskills of New York. Um, so the first one was fooling around with Cinderella and the second one's prancing around with Sleeping Beauty. So um, I'm thinking about 
what I want to do for the next one. So I'm toying with the idea of a Christmas novella. And then I'm thinking about doing um, a third book in the hockey series. And I've been focusing a lot on my editing. I'm also a freelance editor and I teach online courses for writers. So I've been, um, so it's kind of balancing both aspects, the creative side and then the teaching side and working yeah. with authors. Well, and just so our watchers know, um, we do are going to be bringing you back to talk about your editing and all of the, the you're kind of like the back end or the support staff of the author, right? Editors, right. proofreaders, all of that. So we'll have you back to talk about that for those who are interested. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me, what is your favorite genre to read right now? Um, I, I say I, I like reading chiclet um, and women's fiction. I, I love Sophie Kinsella, um, Lauren we Weisberger, um, the, like the Devil Wears Prada. I've read a few of her um, during the pandemic. I've been catching up on some of her books, like um, The Singles Game, it's about a te pro tennis player. Um, I like also like more serious women's fiction books like um, Jodi Picoult. Uh, I just recently read um, The Grace Kelly Dress by um, Brenda Janowitz. That was interesting. So I just, I like reading a variety of genres. And um, right now I'm even reading something totally that's um, kind of different from what I usually read. I got hooked on the Netflix series, The 100. So <laughs> it's a science fiction series. So I'm actually reading the young adult series, The 100. It's a series of four books. So I just kind of read, like what's my writing? I just whatever <laughs> whatever sounds pretty, interesting to me pretty spread out yeah yeah so for those re those readers who are watching this and but don't know the difference between romance and chick lit and women's fiction do you want to give us a little brief description of what what the different genres are i don't think a lot of readers really understand that yeah so there's different like with romance for example there's different um heat levels like there's sweet romance which is that's where my books tend to be more on the clean sweet romance side and then they have um you know steamier romance um and then women's fiction isn't necessarily a romance it could have a romance in it but it's more about a female character in her journey um like Jodi Bacall writes a lot of those kinds kinds of books about just this situation that this, this woman is in and then how she changes and grows and how it affects her. Um, and then- Ray Love is a great example of that. Th yes, exactly. And then Chiclet, I think it would, it would be considered maybe a, a sub-drama of, of women's fiction where um, it's more humorous. Um, you know, there could be a r romance in it, which um, both of my books have, um, my chick that looks, both do have romances in them, but it's it's not just about the romance. It, you know, that's like in a romance novel, a lot of times you have like the alternating viewpoints. Like you, you have a, you might have a chapter from the, the, um, the women and then the next chapter is from the love interest, you know, right. and then it goes back and forth. Whereas Chicklet, it's just more focused on the, on her story. And, you know, there could be a romance in it, but that's not necessarily like what the, whole it, it's not the, hopefully that's happily ever after ending but it's not it's, it's, it's not like a romance where yeah. it's leading up to this happily ever after yeah. ending it's more about her journey and yeah. her growth in a more lighter more humorous way yeah well thank you for that explanation that's good I've, just, I've actually been trying to explain it to some of my readers and some of my beta readers and um it's there's such a fine line right and because romance is also not what it used to be. Our romance readers are much more demanding. They demand a storyline. They demand to have, you know, more than just the relationship. So, um, so that's kind of one of the things that I've been kind of trying to struggle with a little bit, not trying to struggle with, but struggling with and trying to figure out. There you go. So, right. So tell us, the readers that are watching, how can they get a hold of you if they want to try some of your, um, some of your books out? Yep, they can go to my website, stacyjuba.com, and then I have links to all my books. I have a separate website, actually, for my hockey books, hockeyrivalsbooks.com, but I mean, you can access that via my, um, via my main website. And then I have some free sample chapters, like I have a Storybook Valley sampler. If you s wanted to sign up for my newsletter, then you'd get a, um, a couple sample chapters and some behind-the-scenes insights into my Storybook Valley series. And then I also have um, a mystery lover sampler where I have, um, you can get some sample chapters of my mystery books. Um, so 
if they just go to stacyjuba.com, they, they can get all that. And then my books are on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, most of them are on Audible also as audiobooks. Oh, cool. So how did you like the uh, audiobook uh, process? Yeah, it was definitely quite a um, quite an experience, quite a learning experience. Um, I, the yeah, book was like several different narrators. Um, for my hockey books, I worked with this. I was fortunate to work with the same narrator, um, Maxwell Glick, on both books. Um, you know, we worked really well together. And then um, I had different narrators for my mystery novels and my um, my children's box set and my um, first book of my storybook valley series fooling around with Cinderella and it's I think it's a really interesting process readers would find interesting because I had never really thought much about the audiobook process um, I worked with ACX which um, is affiliated with Amazon so I was able to choose my narrator they auditioned um, you upload like a small excerpt and then different narrators will record auditions and then you can listen to them and go see what else they've recorded and just kind of find that who you think is the right voice <laughs> for your story yeah. and I thought it was really interesting how because I, I haven't been a, I've never really been a big audiobook listener myself and my husband likes listening to audiobooks but I'm, I think I'm more visual um, and, and like to actually read the book but I, I was really impressed with how like this one narrator can has all these different inflections to make the characters sound so different. Um, so it's almost like, I always say it's like listening to a movie without the, without the screen, you know, just yeah. listening to a movie because they, they really, it's not like they're just reading it. They're perform they're really right. voice actors performing it. And then the other interesting thing to me was proof listening. You know, you're so used to proof reading a book to make sure there's no mistakes in it, but it's also important to, uh, proof listen like where you listen to what they record um, they would record like a chapter at a time and upload each file so I listen to it with a book in hand and sometimes they'll like read the same sentence twice or they'll mispronounce something um, so you just have to li listen carefully and you know have the book in front of you so you can make sure that they're um, following exactly. that they're following it because they they might um so they might just proof listening is it the same as kind of proof reading where it's hard for you to because i know for me like i have to have another set of eyes look at my work because i know the story and that's what i read is the story is the is the proof listening the same or do you get your husband to listen to it how does that work for your process i just do it myself but i've found that i would listen to each chapter twice like the first time I listened to it, I just listened to it just for the enjoyment because I was because it was fun for me to hear how the narrator was going to perform it and what their interpretation was of like the different tones and like an argument theme, you know, with the the raised voices and the tension. It was just really fun for me to listen to. So I quickly learned that just listen to it for fun the first time so that I'm not distracted and then listen to the chapter again with the book in front of me. And then I just have a notebook and I'll take notes um, as things occur to me. And different narrators, I mean, some nar narrators are very clean um, and they might only have like three mistakes. Um, in the beginning, I, I kind of started doing this in the beginning when ACX was really starting to take off and some of the narrators um, for like actors who hadn't really done narrating before. And so they were kind of learning the process. So um, like for, for somebody like that, they, they were kind of getting their feet wet and developing their experience as a narrator. So they, so they might make more mistakes. So then I, yeah. you know, so in some cases I'd be like, I'd have like a couple of pages of notes. And then there were different things like um, pronunciation, like I remember my narrator for one of my books, I had the word frap, like, you know, like a milkshake and she was yeah. pronouncing it frappe. And I was like, oh, I, I, I always call it frap, but you know, <laughs> different things like that to, you know, and then we're like looking it up on the internet for Google, to, you know, to see who's right. Because I'm like, I think yeah. I'm right. I and mean, she was like, oh, I thought it was the other way. And it's kind of like tomato, tomato, right? They could both be right and they could both be wrong depending on where and in in you are listening to the audio book. Right. That's cool. So um, tell, are all of your books on audio? Or I think the only one that's not right now is Prancing Around with Sleeping Beauty, but um, I think the rest of them are. Yeah. So um, what's your writing style? Are you a plotter or a pantser? Definitely a plotter. Um, like when I, before I start, I like to 
come up with like a pretty lengthy outline and I'll do some, I do like extensive character charts that, that I fill out where I just get to know my main character. And then I might do a little bit of free writing to get to know her or him <laughs> in the case of my hockey books. Um, and then I think a lot about the antagonist, like what, you know, what qualities they have or, you know, where they tend to have conflict. Sometimes it might be multiple antagonists in the book, but I just really give a lot of thought to that. And then I just sit down and come up with an outline, um, which I'll usually type up. And then I always wind up changing the outline as I go along and I'll, you know, write my, scribble my notes in the margin until I can't read it anymore. And then I have to update it on the yeah. computer and print out a fresh copy. So it's not like it's written in stone, but you know, it does evolve, but I find that I really, I, I'm not one to just sit down and impulsively write, you know, I need to have a roadmap of where I'm going. It's a, cause for me, that just really um, helps alleviate the writer's block. And when I finish a scene, I'll, I'll have the outline in front of me and then I'll just kind of write myself a little note, like on a sticky note or something with the list of the main things that are coming up in the next scene. And, um, so that way. As you're going along, you plot it out what you think is going to happen, but then you're open to it changing as the story flows. Yes. Yeah. And, and that does happen sometimes. Even sometimes when I'm writing it, I'll just be writing and then the character will just kind of go off in this other direction. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, where did that come from? But really? I, I yeah. think I like it. Okay. <laughs> let's, yeah. let's explore that. Yeah. That happens to me. I'll do a very rough, outline meaning i say what i want to have happen in the beginning middle and then end just like a one maybe one or two words or a sentence and then i'll do a chapter where i'll just a couple of sentences on each chapter of what i think is going to happen and then by the middle of the book i can't even refer to the outline anymore because i'm so off of the original outline that i'm just taking notes at this point <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to say yeah. I'm a plotter, but honestly, I don't think that's really plotting. I think that's, uh, that's, that's, plot, that's pantsing it. Yeah. It sounds like you're like a kind of a combination and I kind of, I kind of can that can go off in that direction also, but then I find that if I go too far without writing it down, then I start getting like writer's block when I go to the page or I, or I get stuck like, oh, I was, I was planning to go this way. And now, you know, then when I go to write the scene, I'm like, oh, okay, I can't go that way anymore. So then I find that it, I just need to sit down and update my outline with the yep. latest changes. And... Yeah, so that's happened to me as well, where I'll be, I'll have an outline and the story will go off the outline where the outline cannot possibly even be applicable mm -hmm. anymore. It's not even the same book. And then I've had to actually go and rewrite the outline. Now I have to start over and do a new outline based on where I'm at in the story. And I found that that helped me unblock myself. Yeah. So that's good. So what do you do to get inspiration? Um, I think the like, inspiration for all my books is just kind of, you know, come like from things I've observed in my life or places I've been. Like my, um, my mystery novel 25 years ago today was inspired by my my job um, that I used to have is working as an overt writer and a newspaper reporter, like working for a small daily newspaper. Um, so just working for the, for the paper and um, compiling the 25 and 50 years ago today column just inspired me to write a mystery novel because I thought that would be a fun job for the main character to have, um, except like um, she would come across an old murder. Um, and then I, I do a lot of research, you know, if once I get the idea, I'll do like a lot of re research to get inspiration. So I was doing a lot of research into old cases. Um, like for my storybook Valley books, I wanted to write something um, set at a theme park. I mean, I'm, I love theme parks. My husband and I were engaged at Epcot. We um, went to Disneyland Paris on our honeymoon. Um, you know, I got the idea for fooling around with Cinderella when we were actually at a theme park, um, a fairy tale theme park with our kids and they had just gone to meet Cinderella. So I just got this idea of like, what if I wrote a book about a reluctant um, Cinderella who didn't really want to be a Cinderella that you know that would be funny and you know and she who would her prince charming be so so, so I, I think I my inspirations just come from you know different situations I've been in and then I'll do a lot of research just to kind of keep going with that idea like for the storybook valley books I did I wanted to set it in the Catskills of New York I, I'd only been there um, once when I was a kid um, but I'd also been in um, I've been to like New Hampshire a lot, like the mountains. So I, I sent away for like, um, 
you know, brochures from the Chamber of Commerce, Commerce of the Catskills, so I could kind of describe it more and, yeah. um, you know, watched a lot of interviews with Disney princesses and theme park characters and got some of their inside stories. So I, so once I get that idea, I think just doing the research and kind of just immersing myself, you know, in, in in that topic or um, whatever yeah. that that just and inspires story me. really starts developing doesn't it yeah because then ideas will just start when, when I hear something like an interview with a pr Disney princess or something and she'll say something like oh I gotta put that in so you know I'll write yeah down notes so now I do that all day in my real life somebody will do something or something crazy will happen and I have like the note feature on my phone is my best friend I yeah. have like I'll stop whatever's happening I'm like that's going in a book and I'll put it in my notes do you do the same thing I do. Like I have uh, um, on Facebook, a lot of times I'll see something it's, yeah. uh, like, especially like for my, um, most recently, like my hockey novels, I'm thinking about doing a third one. And I'm thinking of like my, my daughter has type one diabetes. I'm thinking about making one of the boys in the book have type one diabetes, how that would affect the hockey career. I'm not, I'm not sure, but it's just not a, a, a kind of a, idea I'm exploring. So I'll, it, uh, whenever I, sometimes something will come across my Facebook where it'll be like an interview, like a podcast interview or a book about like a NHL player or a college player who has diabetes or a football player with diabetes and I'll save it to my saved folder. I have like different folders for my different saved, you know, different categories on Facebook, like just recipes or, yeah. you know, interesting yeah. things. But I have one for research things like, oh, that'll be useful to me later. And a lot of my storybook Valley series is very quirky um lots of quirky fun characters so if i see something um like on facebook or that's just really quirky like you know i think one time i saw something like a, print, a pinterest thing somebody had shared about i don't know it was like some, somebody that made like little hats for frog statues and i was like oh my god that would be totally so i could totally see the frog statues yeah. in storybook valley with the little hats that you know so i save it yeah. it's just for those authentic little details that i never could come up with myself but um so i have i have those on facebook and then i have like a trello i use trello where it's like an online kind of planner i have um i have like a storybook valley board where i just kind of save things like that. Or sometimes I'll go into my Facebook and clean up all those saved links and yeah. paste the links into Trello. So they're just all in one place. Um, That's great. Good for you. Yeah. I love stories. I'm, I'm kind of um, somebody who I like, I'm not an introvert, so I'm not a normal writer, mm -hmm. um, but I don't like people a lot. So I have a lot of animals. <laughs> and, <laughs> um but I don't have a problem going out, but I get a lot of really cool stories. And so all, all of my books will have some rescue in them. All of my books have some rescue or some funny animal thing or, you know, some sad animal thing. So they say to write about the thing that you know, if you write about your own life or things that you're familiar with, even if you're adding in things that you've had to research, you're still giving some, you know, substance to your book. So it sounds like that's exactly what you do. Right. And um, you know, my character, Jane, has a cat, just like <laughs> I have a cat, or, you know, another one of my characters, I think Chris in 25 years ago today, she has a cat. So, you know, I, I would typically give like, a, you know, I've had cats my whole life. So yeah, the same that's kind of thing. Like it's a mix of things that are, yeah. that I learn about, but also that's just things that I know that. about from my own life. So how long does it take you from start to finish to write a book? It um, varies. Like when I was younger, I would write a lot faster. Um, it might take me like six months to a year. Um, since I had kids, it, it, I, <laughs> it took me um, a lot longer. I mean, now that they're getting older, um, you know, they're teenagers now, it, I have more time than I used to. So like my, fa my offside sequel, I think I was it was basically rewriting a book I had written years ago, but I literally rewrote every word. And yeah. I did that um, from the time I started it, like maybe like in February to releasing it. Um, it was in like December. So it was a little less than a year. Um, but when my kids were younger, like my, my storybook Valley books took me like a couple of years because I was doing it in between, um, you know, they weren't as able to entertain themselves as much as they can now, you know, when, <clears throat> when they were younger and, um, just balancing that between like, you know, my freelance writing and my other responsibilities. So, um, 
it's just kind of, again, that kind of evolves. So it kind of, so it kind of depends ages. on where you're at yeah. in life, what's going on. What's and going I, that's on. the same answer I have. I'm actually setting myself on a very strict schedule for the rest of the year um, because otherwise, you know, I feel like the words, getting the words down, and mind you, I'm brand new author. I've been writing my entire life since I was seven, but I'm just published. I'm coming up on one year anniversary of my first book being published. Oh, wow. And, mm -hmm. um, so uh, I feel like what's happened with me over the year is I just had my fourth book out, but um, the words are the easiest thing to put off. Getting the words down, life will come in. And if you don't prioritize getting those words down, they, you, you could go a week and realize you haven't written a word, right? So what I've just done recently is I've strategized myself to um, – right every single day. I have about a minimum amount I have to get out every single day. And if I don't meet it, then that means I have to roll it over. So I'm being very strict with myself because, because I'm kind of, I'm, I'm a controlled chaos mm -hmm. kind of person. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I think yeah. you have to, if you have like a certain deadline, you know, um, and when I was working on my offsides book, I did have like this deadline where I, I wanted it to be out like by, by Christmas. That was my goal. So I would, I would try to work like um, every day, at least like two hours on it, you know, and not everybody might have time to do that. Some people might only have time to do like 10 minutes a day, but you know, whatever amount you can do, I think it's a lot easier to go back to it. If, if you've, you know, we just worked on it the day before was if you take a week or two off, then it's a lot harder to come back to it and get into that flow again. So for me, I was, when my kids were at school, I'd work like a couple hours on it and then I would do like my editing or, you know, or whatever, my book promotion or whatever in the afternoon yeah. um, or my errands you know, just so I could get that, carve out that so whatever amount of time. I don't know how can. you mommies with children can do it. Like my kids are all grown and gone. I have grandbabies that come over and um, I I couldn't write with my children when we're, we're young. So God bless you all. I mean, you're just amazing that you can organize and, and write with children around. It's <laughs> Yeah, I was fortunate my, um, when my kids were really little, my parents would come over sometimes and my mom would come over and babysit or they would take them for the day or my mother-in-law used to come over once a week and, um, you know, just, you know, when my kids were babies and, you know, play with them. But because um, without that, I think it would be really hard. I remember at a conference, I heard one author talk about how she used to have to just go in her car in the garage. <laughs> you know, right home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or just, you know, lock themselves in the bathroom. <laughs> Yeah, like 10 minutes. The bathroom, yeah. <laughs> Get up at three o'clock in the morning to go right, you know. That, yeah. That, yeah. Um, so uh, we're reaching the end of our video, but there's a couple more questions I want to ask you. So let's let's try to buzz through those. One, um, you said that you are available on Barnes and Nobles um, and Amazon. Did you say Apple Books as well? Yes. And so yep. so you're wide then you're you're out with in all the platforms. Yeah, right now I am. I've, I've been in and out of that over the years. There have been times when I have just been exclusive with Amazon, but right now I'm wide. Um, and How's that working out for you? Yeah, it's, it's been going good. I, I use um, like draft to digital to distribute my books to like Barnes and Noble and Kobo and libraries. And I've been seeing an increase in sales there. Um, yeah, and most of them are in paperback also. And my, my mystery novels um, right now, they're just available as like used paperback. So they're still in, you know, they're in, in Kindle and ebook forms and audible forms. One, um, one of my goals on my list is to go back and do paperback versions of those books, just like new, new copies, um, you know, to get the print version back into print, but all my other books are also available in print editions also. So yeah, my books are all wide right now, but I'm actually thinking about pulling back and going into KU just so I can focus on writing and getting a really good backlist. And then, pulling them back out and going wide because it's, I'm finding all my time is going to managing the platforms and getting the promotions done and all of that thing. And it's, it's interfering with the writing. Yeah. The, 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 there is so much, <laughs> so much to do. Yeah. I think you just got to find out what, what works like for the book promotion. I was finding that I was spending so many times on all these little things and I just kind of had to focus more on the few what's main your, things that work the most. What's the best yeah. way you like to communicate with your readers? Is it through your newsletter? Is it through, do you have a, a Facebook reader group? How do you like to interact with your readers? Um, I have a newsletter, like an email list um, and then a blog. So I'll email my readers. Um, like sometimes I'll ask them like a question, like, you know, I'll tell them 
um, like what, what I've been reading lately. And I'll say, hey, do you, what should I read next? Or what have you been reading? And a lot of times they'll reply to me. So that's always nice to kind of talk to them. Um, and then I have a Facebook page. I also have a Facebook group like a, um, for my Storybook Valley books. So um, sometimes I'll go in there, Storybook Valley Sweethearts. Um, and yeah, and like Instagram, I've, I've met a lot of readers over um, Instagram, like we'll, we'll direct message. So I'm very active on social media. Good for you. I think, I think we met on Facebook, right? Yes. Was it the yeah. podcasting group or which group was it that we, we met on? Was it the SPF group? Oh, I, SPF. I think I saw your, I just happened to see the comment. Yeah, I, that's yeah. right. I commented yeah. and said, you know, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I love SPF. I bought, bought, have purchased all of Mark Dawson's, um, you know, um, uh, trainings. And um, now I just have to make myself sit down and, and watch them. But again, it's just it's so much. It can be so like overwhelming. Um, so now your first book was picked up by Avon. Is that what you said? Yes. So now are you an indie author now or are you still... Um, Chad published with some of your books. Um, now I'm indie, like for my books 25 years ago today and Sink or Swim, which were the next books that I had published after Face Off, those were with a small publisher um, for the print books. And then I had the ebook rights. Um, and then I, I'm just been ever since then, I've been indie because I just found that um, like working with a small press that the the royalties I could get on Amazon were a lot higher than if I shared it like with a small press. Um, and then I just found like, I just, um, just I've had agents and everything, but just like the submission process was takes so long and, you know, waiting for an answer and everything. And I just, once I kind of jumped into indie publishing with my eBooks and then I just really liked being in charge of everything and kind of an entrepreneur. I think I have a very entrepreneurial mindset. So I, for me, I really enjoy um, indie publishing. So that's what I've been doing since then. That's great. I think that um, things are changing. I don't think readers are super savvy between the difference of indie and trad. You know, I don't think that they really pay much attention to it. I think that's an author, an author thing, but I think that um, it's changed everything. It's changed everything. Individuals being able to publish their own books and form their own publishing companies. Yeah, it really has. And um, I think that's led to the growth of things like what I'm doing is with the freelance editing, just because there's so many authors now that, um, you know, they don't have to go through, you know, what I, all that struggle that back when I was starting out, like there really wasn't indie publishing, you could self publish, but, you know, but then you'd have to pay like a lot of money for print copies to lug around in your trunk or whatever. And now you don't have to do that. You know, it's print on demand and eBooks. So there, I think that's inspired a lot more writers to explore the different options. Like some, the dream is to be published traditionally, but some, um, you know, they just don't want to deal with all the going back and forth and waiting and they just want to get their books out there. So um, I think that's really led to a rise in different surface providers like cover designers, proofreaders, copy editors. Yeah, I think it's become more of an open industry and not so closed down where, you know, the, the, the and it's also the mystique isn't, isn't so much there either because people like you and I can get in there and get it, get our books published without having to wait 18 months you know right <laughs> so well thank you stacy i appreciate you coming on uh terry's tribe and it's been great fun having you i cannot wait to have you back i i'd like to invite mm -hmm. you to come back and talk about your editing and all the other things that you do for authors um and then you know what when you've got another release coming out come back and talk about it it's been a lot of fun to have you and so if mm -hmm. the if my viewers want to get a hold of you let's find let's tell them again how we can get a hold of you Yep. So just go to stacyjuba.com and I have like a contact button and all my social media links. So feel free to just, um, you know, tag me on social media, send me a message and say, hi. That's I'm most great. active on Instagram, I'd say Instagram and Facebook. And then also on your um, email or on your website, you have um, sample chapters. So that's a good yep. way to be on your email list, get on my email. Your newsletter. Yeah. So I encourage everybody go check her out. 
uh, stacyjuba.com and go sign up for her uh, newsletter. Go join her group. Go check her out on Facebook. She's on Instagram, you guys. So go hit her up and check out her books. Thanks, Stacy. No, oh, thank you. Yeah. And everybody, thank you so very much for joining me again. I appreciate it. And remember, we have a free book out, the brand new Women of Wine Country, Babies and Badass. You don't want to miss that. Grief and Greed launches the end of September. And after that, when Grief and Greed comes out, Babies and Badass will not be free anymore. So don't miss your opportunity. See you guys later. Stay safe. Stay sane. Love you all. <laughs>